It's a pleasure to have all of you in this panel. I think it's actually the only panel related with the, uh, medicines and COVID. Maybe it's a, a topic that is still, still quite relevant nowadays. So my name is Diana Maria Beltran from the University of Externa. I've been moderating this panel. And here, here uh, I have the company of Chris Herrera from the University of Sinan as well. Uh, also, uh, we have virtually the Peter Orna is joining us from the University of Lima. Right? Uh, Dante Mendoza next to me. <laughs> and Ray Meloni is with us to discuss this very interesting topic. So, uh, first, uh, Pierre is going to make uh, an introduction, a presentation, over which uh, we're going then to follow with a comments from Luisa and the presentations from our colleagues from Universidad de Lima. So, Pierre, if you're listening to us, you can start. Um, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Great. So, um, <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for your uh, invitation to participate in this panel on uh, competition and uh, IP related issues. Uh, let me just give some uh, introductory remarks on this research that the University of Lima did um, uh, started uh, two years ago with um, a distinguished uh, uh, set of um, ideas that were actually prompted back in the day in October 2020, when uh, India and South Africa first proposed the idea of a TRIPS waiver uh, to foster uh, COVID-19 vaccines, uh, to access COVID-19 vaccines back in the day. Uh, as, you, as we all remember, uh, this was um, a heavily contained issue worldwide because of uh, the way um, vaccines uh, were actually produced and prompted in different developed countries. Um, actually, um, pharmaceutical, in, the pharmaceutical companies uh, lobbied against TRIPS waiver uh, for many reasons. Um, and um, at the end of the day, uh, the, the way it was actually promoted by leaving, leading economies, Nobel Prize economies like Joseph Stiglitz to actually say, that um, this is against uh, humanity, what is happening currently or at that time in 2020, 2021. So the research is more about uh, during that period in time where um, access to COVID-19 vaccines in developing countries uh, was heavily hampered incidentally or I'd say allegedly by the fact that the, the TRIPS waiver did not exist or was not adopted. So <clears throat> just as a way of uh, recollection of facts, if uh, we all remember uh, the, the, the question of TRIPS, which uh, my colleague Ryan Meloni will talk about this in the more detailed, uh, has become traditionally a battleground between big pharma companies and global public health advocates. And this is not a surprise. Um, I've heard the panel discussions on the WTO law, international trade law, and how it actually has been advocating uh, a specific type of principles of international economic law. But it is true that the political economy uh, aspects of it can actually be hampered uh, or even established since the creation of the WTO back in 1995. And um, the friction between uh, companies uh, trying to lobby against um, uh, even the adoption of the TRIPS agreement came into play uh, once again with this discussion. During the months of, um, during the sort of like two years or even more, uh, less than two years, I would say between October 2020 and July 2022, they were back and forth uh, by the WTO TRIPS Council in terms of adopting the uh, waiver uh, decision um, and um, and unfortunately uh, once it came which was in July 2022 um, uh, many of uh, the hopes from developing countries were not even there but actually um, this is something that um, even has been 
heavily criticized by his, uh, scholarship uh, in different countries, including in the two proposed countries that originally uh, uh, sort of suggested uh, or the, the WIPS waiver, uh, the, the TRIPS waiver back in October 2020 20, uh, by India and South Africa. And that's how we actually looked at it uh, because in July 2022, when the WTO TRIPS waiver actually, um, um, uh, can you hear me please? I think there is some problems with my audio. No, there, there is no problem. There is no problem. We are hearing. Okay, so I just saw a message here. So one of the areas that the TRIPS waiver uh, did not actually cover, and that's something that we are actually addressing in our paper and research, it had excluded COVID-19 diagnosis and therapeutics from its fold, and we only focus on COVID-19 vaccines. And as many uh, scholars said, too little, too late, uh, that came on, only there in 2022, last year. Another problem that happened during this this July 2022 uh, ministerial conference, MC12, it does the TRIPS waiver restricted uh, its coverage to only patents and leaving out other in IP rights. That's something that we will discuss in the paper as well. Excluding also the developed countries that possess manufacturing and technological capability from being eligible exporters of COVID-19 vaccines. And that is uh, extremely important. And one final area that actually kept silence with this waiver was the transfer of technology, which by the way, has been one of our main uh, strongholds as well in our research. So um, going a little bit what happened in the last months, uh, if you look at um, declarations from um, different uh, stakeholders that uh, have assessed what is the impact of the TRIPS waiver uh, since July 2022 up to the present time. Uh, you see, for instance, in March 2023, um, the outgoing uh, COE of Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, which of course have been in charge of COVAX, as you all remember, it was an important aspect to, to, for developing countries to accessing uh, uh, vaccines, said, and I quote, so much energy went into calling for patent waivers for COVID-19 vaccines, instead of getting companies to be transparent on where doses were going. You know, and I continue with the quote, it was a challenge because here we're in the middle of this emergency and there was a whole community that said that this is what we have to do and focus only and push it onwards. And that for us was totally irrelevant. With this quote, one could actually say uh, that the whole uh, specific uh, ways in which the tips waiver were prompted probably did not take into account other aspects of how to access the vaccine in a more effective way. And uh, and if we look at if we look at, for instance, in the area of other uh, vaccines against malaria. You can see uh, recently uh, news about the rolling out of the first malaria vaccines in Africa in 12 countries with 18 million doses that ex exemplifies how partnerships have shaped the malaria vaccine market. And this goes into a series of negotiations between the different stakeholders from when the one side, the, 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 book cover, the, the pharmaceutical companies and the other one is the stakeholders on the uh, uh, health uh, global health partnerships. So this is, of course, uh, some of the areas that our paper has addressed because on the one hand, and this is based on interviews we carried out to the said countries uh, in, the, uh, in South Africa, India, Peru, Colombia, uh, and, and, and other stakeholders. And that will also lead to, to, to what is the purpose of this uh, uh, research. So intellectual property and competition law in the pharmaceutical sector during the COVID-19 pandemic has shown this paper that public policies linked to intellectual property and competition would not have been adequate to allow the population's timely access to vaccines in an equitable manner due to the alleged distortion in the manufacture, distribution and sale of COVID-19 vaccines during the months of the pandemic 2020. And that is where we critically assess this period in the research. 
So we are focusing more on the legal perspectives where the problems were originated either in an inadequate application of the legislations related to intellectual property and its relation with all the public policies. The whole uh, research or the whole rhetoric here is that whether developing countries had false hopes on the TRIPS waiver at the time in 2020, even when the proposed uh, alleged uh, global adoption of the TRIPS waiver by, led by South Africa and India actually created false hopes instead of focusing on the interrelation of other public policies like we actually say. Uh, linked to competition policy. Uh, today in the morning, we, we heard about competition policy issues as well being an important part of international trade liberalization. So there is uh, uh, the possibility of including that in the, in the paper. And as a matter of fact, uh, the research is relevant to understand the lessons learned how from the COVID-19 crisis in vaccine manufacturing and how to anticipate trade and legitimate barriers in case of future pandemics, because that is something that we'll be, we'll be facing near in the near future. So as to ensure that the timely manufacturing and distribution of vaccines in a competitive, fair and transparent purpose takes place. A final point that I would like to add is that this research is the basis of another research that we are currently working on the vaccine supply chain with comparative analysis on South Africa, India, Indonesia, Peru, Colombia, which will be published uh, hopefully in a later stage this year. So with that, uh, I would like to stop here my remarks. And of course, I will be happy if there are some questions at the end to cover some of the points. I will now lead uh, to my colleagues, Dante and Wright to continue with the explanation of this research. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I think that it's important that we elaborate from a couple of points that, he, that uh, Professor Horman has established. That I think are relevant. One is the distortion that it has been created in the market, and also the transparency from the companies and, of course, the stakeholders. But before going into that, <laughs> please, uh, if you please, this is possible. Thank you so much, and thank you all for the interest, uh, the, the interest in this subject, which is very important. And the previous uh, professor was commenting, he started uh, talking about the waiver. And I think all of you heard about the, 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 this proposal about waiving, waiving. The meaning of waiver is to stop uh, applying the TRIPS agreement, which establishes the whole IP system in, in the, in the the WTO members uh, in the world, uh, basically. So um, this paper, uh, what I would like to, to comment, I, I would like to present some comments only regarding the IP matters and the patent um, criteria, and patent analysis that they have done in this research. Firstly, I would like to um, to, to make a first remark regarding the, uh, this contradiction that is well known between IP and competition. I won't focus on, competi on competition, but I, I would like to specify that it's been discussed a lot about this contradiction, but also many authors have maintained that actually there is not a real contradiction between IP, which is exclusive rights, and the right to compete, but actually they are complementary tools and actually uh, right now I'm, I'm handling, I'm doing my research, my PhD research at Queen Mary and I'm focusing a little bit on this but also in contract law. Um, I, I would like to, to, to read some of the comments that I, I made regarding the, the research and regarding some of the aspects that are covered in the research. But I would like to point out that um, this is an, a very important discussion about whether if we maintain that a waiver of the trips is needed, that's because we're maintaining that, as professor said, and as they are kind of showing in the research, is that the IP system is not working. So if exclusive rights are not working, something in the public policy behind the patent system is not working. 
Uh, therefore, we, we need to see what is not working or whether and it's something that I maintain and that I have been always uh, trying to, to, to demonstrate is that actually probably the problem is not the pattern itself, I mean the exclusive right itself, but the way the exclusive right is being used. So focusing on AP, I would like to present these concrete comments regarding some of the most important points analyzing the paper, regarding some of the uh, some of the researches that I'm also covering in my own research in my PhD. So, first of all, I would like to point out that although scarcity, scarcity and exclusivity, uh, exclusivity are thought to generate more innovation, if that's basically the purpose, and actually they also talk about this in their research about the compensation I receive an exclusive right, it's also because later on this is going to be public and the public is going to know the invention and there is this social pact as they mentioned in their research. However, when too many individuals own pieces of one thing, nobody can use it. And actually that's what is happening with many inventions in telecommunications, not only in pharmaceuticals, but in telecommunications. That's why we are um, now seeing many standard setting organizations uh, about uh, trying to, to set some uh, technical standards regarding 5G in order to be able to access some technologies that are already patented. So if everything is patented, for example, on this phone, only through contracts is possible to access the technology that is patented in this phone. And that if I denied the contract and if I denied the license, I'm blocking somehow competition. That's also a competition matter. Michael Heller called this paradox of the pre market DMT commons actually is very well known the end comes. Not only does it prevent innovation, but it also obstructs or blocks access to patentable, patentable inventions such as medical technologies or pharmaceuticals. Market failures, and they talk about market failures uh, in, their, in their research, and I would like to specify that there are many market failures. And also depending on the market failure, depending also on that to, to, to obtain the solution or to build a, faith, a feasible solution. And there are failures such as, for example, patent pickets, which is also the accumulation of patent rights in, in some inventions that are related, or other non-desirable commercial practices that are also called as abuse. So there is another subject that is covering the research that is very interesting regarding the abuse. However, there is a confusion somehow uh, in general, uh, sometimes and even in students, when they confuse the abuse of rights doctrine in general, as, as a concept of private law, and uh, the abuse of dominance in the market, which is completely different. And actually, in patent, we call patent misuse, which is a specific concept different, actually, from the abuse of rights, from private, private law, and also is different from the uh, abuse of dominance in the market. So we see that there are concepts that are, are beyond and that go farther, even IP law and competition law that could be also related to private law, which makes it more interesting. There are failures in question uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the market, and on, if this is not only during the pandemic, but the pandemic made things more obvious, like these kind of market failures. For example, overprotections over that results from patenting strategies being applied both contractually and non-contractually. So there are many patentability strategies. Uh, there is one, one very well known, which is evergreening. Evergreening is trying to cover more of the invention that was already patented, but trying to cover more inventions. So there are some strategies that could be also seen uh, as non desirable practices from IP law and from competition law as well. And justify refusals to license, as I commented before. If I refuse to license, but there is not 
an objective reason to do so. And that could happen also with vaccines, and that happens a lot with vaccines. So one of the main questions regarding uh, the possibility to do, uh, for example, to, to, to uh, concede compulsory licensing was whether uh, nations were able or producers, regional or national producers were able uh, even to produce or if there was a sufficient infrastructure to produce or to distribute vaccines. And third of all, infringement lawsuits and forms of injunctive relief that can block or hamper the development of new or follow-on innovation. And something that happens in pharmaceutical industries, not only the hampering the access to medicines, and as we know this, but also the innovation is being hampered. So all of these are questions that should be analyzed in order to determine if really uh, the public policy behind the patent system uh, is, is something wrong or what are the problems. In the pharmaceutical sector, for example, flaws or drawbacks or market failures have been noticed in some reports, for example, the 2009 pharmaceutical report of the European Commission. And this report, I recommend its reading because in this report they mention all the practices that have been um, carried on by uh, pharmaceutical companies. Uh, in this report, and most of them in the European um, courts and the European Commission, most of them have been addressed from competition law. But actually, competition law is not only the solution, but because also the analysis could be also important to, to be done from IP law perspective. As the researchers, uh, uh, our uh, professors, our, our colleagues commented their paper during the pandemic, it became clear that beyond criteria on patents or, or the analysis on patents, access to medicines also requires a study on the sufficient or insufficient infrastructure to manufacture and to distribute pharmaceuticals as well as the study of purchasing contracts, and they cover also the question about purchasing contracts, and of course, the possibility to have, uh, as any other contracts, abusive clauses or anti-competitive clauses. Uh, starting, uh, so one thing that I would like to point, out, to point out regarding the analysis that could be done from public policies analysis, and it's, it's also important to be very careful because public policy could be international or national. Because even though we have the international one established in TRIPS agreement, this is not the only one that establishes the public policy behind the patent system. But also regional and nationally, it's important to analyze, to analyze these public policies. Why is it important to analyze it? Because in this way, it is possible to determine what are really the objectives or, of the patent system. And actually, the patent system, if it is to be effective, should not hinder innovation at all, and also nor access. And it should allow for the transfer or licensing of exclusive rights during pandemic or not during a pandemic. It's not a uh, of course, a pandemia makes more evident and more um, uh, approachable these subjects, but it's not only during, during the pandemia. And the TRIPS agreement establishes that uh, the objective is to the mutual, and this is literally in the TRIPS agreement, to the mutual advantage of producers and users of technological knowledge and in a manner conductive to social and economic welfare. Therefore, there is a content regarding the objective to accomplish social benefit in general and to benefit not only uh, producers, but also consumers. And this is very important regarding pharmaceuticals, of course. By granting the owner of an invention a temporary monopoly right, the patent system empowers the beneficiaries of exclusivity to innovate as much as it is practicable, practicable to decide whether to license their rights. And this is important because uh, it's been uh, very, it's been, it's been discussed whether uh, 
compensation uh, is enough in order to promote innovation and if exclusivity is enough to promote innovation. So, um, finally, I would like just to, to remember that uh, there, there is always a contradiction between authors. Some authors have maintained that intellectual property rights are the best and uh, the, the, the best reward and the most proportionate one and that is needed. In, the, in that way, we couldn't maintain or we couldn't say that IP is a problem itself or the exclusive right itself is a problem, but the way it's being managed through contracts as well. So, for example, Bentham uh, maintained that intellectual property rights are of all the rewards the best proportionate. Of course, this is being discussed because some practices but this could be challenge, uh, uh, especially because there are some practices that pertain to the exploitation of patent rights have been identi identified as unjustified or disproportionate strategies that patent holders employ in order to earn excessive rewards. And that's what is being called by courts as patent misuse. In Europe, it's been the patent misuse addressed from competition law, as I said before. And in the United States, actually, there's, um, I, I would like just to point out, uh, just to mention one of the cases in Berkhoit versus Mid-Continent. It's very interesting how the Supreme Court of the United States approach uh, the concept of patent misuse in order to also to say that there is a uh, social, there are so, some social goals behind the patent system and behind the patent public policy. So in that way, uh, and the analysis that I have been doing, I can find that the patent policy behind the patent system maintains or establishes uh, some foundations uh, looking or trying to accomplish also social benefit. So probably, and just, this is just one question, is it really the problem in the patent public, uh, in the public policy behind the patent system or in the exclusive right? Or maybe we should analyze further concepts such as patent misuse and other concepts. Finally, I, I completely agree with um, uh, the, one of the conclusions regarding this uh, research where they maintain that it's needed the coordination and cooperation between IP authorities and competition offices and, or authorities. And uh, finally, a grounded analysis of the concept of abuse is required, taking into account that abuse is a violation and is how you exercise a right against its purpose. And basically that's what has happened in pharmaceutical industry and in other industries uh, regarding patents. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Lisa. So uh, with those highlights and uh, all uh, the comments regarding the, the work of professors from Universidad de Lima, it's important that we can disclose later uh, what you mentioned specifically regarding the social benefits because indeed the problem is not the patent, the problem is how you use it. Right? So in that regard, I would give the floor for professors. Uh, first of all, thank you, Laura, for your comments. Lisa, sorry. Then, uh, on behalf of uh, Universidad de Lima, let me thank you for this invitation to see you. And also, Universidad de Estampao y Universidad de Rosario. Eh, let me switch into Spanish. Eh, hemos hecho una investigación desde la Universidad de Lima vinculada con los derechos de propiedad intelectual y la libre competencia durante la pandemia en el sector farmacéutico. ¿no? Intellectual property and competition law in the pharmaceutical sector during the COVID eh, pandemic. Esto ha sido patrocinado por el Instituto de Investigación de la Universidad de Lima y los profesores Dante Mendoza y quien les habla, vamos a hablar sobre este tema. Rápidamente les hablaremos cosas que ya Luisa nos ha mencionado, la, las invenciones a nivel mundial se protegen a través de algo que se llama patentes. ¿sí? Estos documentos de patentes conceden derechos exclusivos a la explotación comercial. Este incentivo, esta protección, este derecho de exclusividad, no es otra cosa que una... De, un incentivo o una recompensa para potenciar, digo, para que los inventores 
puedan obtener ganancias, profit, utilidades a partir de sus inversiones. Lo que están buscando, el, o lo que busca el sistema de patentes, es un equilibrio para que nuestros inventores sigan trabajando y obtengan una recompensa a partir de esto. Las patentes pueden recaer en cualquier campo de la industria o de la tecnología. Obviamente, en patentes farmacéuticas hay muchas. Entonces, esto va a permitir una patente, nos va a dar este derecho de exclusividad para que una persona en particular, dentro de determinado territorio, pueda explotar comercialmente la patente. ¿Sí? Y aquí vamos a tener una suerte de posiciones encontradas desde la Organización Mundial del Comercio y de la Organización Mundial de la Salud. La Organización Mundial de la Salud va seguramente a impulsar para que las patentes farmacéuticas generen beneficios a la sociedad y ciertamente la Organización Mundial del Comercio para que las patentes generen beneficios a los inventores. ¿Sí? Entonces, hasta aquí solamente una introducción. ¿Qué hemos encontrado a partir de la investigación que hemos hecho desde la Universidad de Lima? Lo primero es que la pandemia, y, digamos, del COVID-19, ha producido aproximadamente, estos datos no son, todavía no han sido validados, entre 6.8 y 10 millones de muertes a nivel mundial. Se dice que probablemente haya más. Esto es básicamente, si pasas a una más, una más. La anterior, la anterior, la anterior a esta, ¿no? Una antes. Esto aquí, sí. Eh, a ver, la, digamos que la vacuna empezó a proporcionarse a los países a finales del de 2020, del año 2020. Las muertes se produjeron porque se han identificado objetivamente que había, otro pro, había problemas en las eh, extorsiones, en las órdenes de compra que han lanzado los estados, las inversiones que hicieron los estados, y problemas en la distribución y en la venta de las vacunas. ¿no? Desde la Universidad de Lima, en el año 2021, iniciamos una investigación destinada a identificar cuáles han sido estos problemas, a qué se debe que ha habido una distribución inequitativa de las vacunas. Eso es un hecho objetivo, porque las vacunas llegaron primero a algunos países y han llegado después a otros países. ¿Correcto? ¿Cuál ha sido el motivo? ¿Y en qué momento? ¿Qué lapso ha habido entre la distribución de una vacuna y otra? Y eso lo va a comentar el sortante en la segunda parte de la presentación. ¿Okay? La primer, la, el primer cuestionamiento que se hace a nivel mundial, si es que en realidad es si en los derechos de propiedad intelectual o las patentes farmacéuticas son los responsables de esta distribución inequitativa. Desde la Organización Mundial del Comercio, vamos a ver ahora que países como la India y como Sudáfrica presentaron una solicitud para que se produzca algo que se llama un waiver, que acaba de mencionar nuestra colega Luisa que es una suspensión de los derechos de propiedad intelectual. ¿Ok? Entonces, las preguntas donde eran si han sido derechos de propiedad intelectual los que han impedido una distribución equitativa de las vacunas, o si ha sido alguna práctica competitiva de algunos laboratorios farmacéuticos que han producido este, finalmente esta distribución que objetivamente se realizó de manera inequitativa. ¿Qué ha dicho la Organización Mundial de Comercio frente a la pandemia? Que la pandemia ha sido una pandemia bidireccional, porque los países han sufrido de manera diferente la pandemia. Algunos países, países desarrollados, de altos ingresos o ingresos medios altos, han utilizado hasta el 75% de todas las de la vacunas que se generaron a nivel mundial. Mientras que los países pobres, por otro lado, esto se especula mucho porque ustedes saben que la negociación o los contratos han sido reservados, pero se especula que los países pobres han pagado los precios más altos por las vacunas del COVID-19. Por otro lado, la Organización Mundial de Comercio ha dicho que los problemas se pueden basar, en otras cosas, en los elevados costos en los eh, productos críticos para la fabricación de las vacunas y la escasa colaboración para reducir los aranceles eh, a, de alguna manera, la distribución de vacunas. ¿Qué han dicho, o qué, qué se dijo en el Consejo de los Alpics, impulsado, repito, por Sudáfrica y eh, la India en el año 
2020, 2 de octubre del año 2020, solicitaron ante el Consejo de los Artics que se produzca este huelga, que es la suspensión de los derechos de propiedad intelectual vinculados directamente con las vacunas a propósito del COVID-19. No ha sido sino hasta el año 2022 que la Organización Mundial del Comercio, dentro del Consejo de los Artics, adoptó una decisión ministerial autorizando el uso de las vacunas, suspendiendo el derecho de propiedad intelectual sobre las vacunas, solamente sobre las vacunas. ¿Sí? Inicialmente el pedido de Sudáfrica y la India fue extender la exención o la suspensión a otros derechos de propiedad intelectual. El Consejo de los ATPIC solamente ha dado esta prohibición, o mejor dicho, eh, deja de, de dar protección a, a, las, a las vacunas, solamente a las vacunas y no a las patentes sobre las vacunas, y no otro derecho sobre la propiedad intelectual. La pregunta aquí, ¿qué hay de vacunas? ¿no? ¿Ha sido el waiver la solución a los problemas que ha generado la distribución inequitativa de las vacunas? Por un lado, tenemos un dato, un dato objetivo, un dato cierto. Ha habido una distribución inicial, repito, inequitativa de las vacunas, luego quizás solamente se va a referir a esto. Pero esto se ha debido a, lo, a, digamos, a los derechos de propiedad intelectual. O más bien, han habido otros problemas en los países. En la negociación, en los contratos con los laboratorios farmacéuticos, titulares de las, de las vacunas, en la producción, almacenamiento y distribución de las vacunas, ¿qué es lo que está pasando? ¿No? ¿Va más allá de la propiedad intelectual el tema? ¿O se debe quedar la discusión o centrar en la propiedad intelectual? ¿Cuál ha sido la finalidad o el objetivo de nuestra investigación? Las pandemias, lamentablemente, no van a terminar aquí. ¿Correcto? Probablemente tengamos en el futuro más pandemias. El problema es, ¿estamos preparados para afrontar una nueva pandemia en Latinoamérica o en los países de renta media o en los países pobres o en los países en vías de desarrollo? Actualmente hemos identificado si hay barreras comerciales o legislativas y si las hay, ¿cuáles son? Todo es responsabilidad de los derechos de la propiedad intelectual o no lo son. Porque si no superamos o no respondemos a estas preguntas, identificar el problema es parte de la solución. Si no identificamos el problema, nos va a volver a pasar exactamente lo mismo. Vamos a volver a tener los mismos problemas. O sea, parte de la investigación, obviamente no es concluyente, esta investigación la hemos abierto para generar nuevas investigaciones, pero para poner sobre la mesa que los derechos de propiedad intelectual no necesariamente son los responsables. Tal vez el debate debe ir más allá de la propiedad intelectual. Tal vez debemos identificar la capacidad de los laboratorios farmacéuticos a nivel mundial para producir vacunas. Tal vez debe haber una transferencia tecnológica entre los grandes laboratorios farmacéuticos, de hecho la India está liderando estos procesos en África, por ejemplo, y los laboratorios locales este, más pequeños. ¿no? Y además, habría que identificar si hay alguna barrera de acceso al mercado que impida a los países el desarrollo de su capacidad para producir vacunas. Esto, de alguna manera, es un pedido que han hecho Australia, Canadá, Chile, Colombia, Nueva Zelanda, Noruega, Turquía, ante el director general de la Organización Mundial de Comercio, este, en hace algunos años. Esto es lo que yo quiero dejar un poco. Son, hemos intentado a través de la investigación responder algunas preguntas, pero hemos generado muchas más. ¿no? Este, repito, la investigación no es concluyente. Sin embargo, ha generado, creo, un espacio de debate interesante para otros temas. Uh, so, before we continue with Dante, just for the people who is following us virtually, if you please, in a couple of sentences, uh, summarize what you just said in English, just for them to follow up. Uh, because I think it's really interesting that, yes, basically your research has way more questions than to which it, it began. Indeed, the pandemic is not one pandemic. You're going to be facing way many pandemics and way many crises, and how the law is uh, prepared for these kinds of situations, right? So, please, Professor Dante. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I will address to you in Spanish, <laughs> the foreign. I feel more comfortable. 
y contexto. Es bien importante entender por qué iniciamos esta investigación. Porque era casi un lugar común decir que las patentes y los malos laboratorios farmacéuticos eran los culpables de que, que no vayan a llegar las vacunas a tiempo a los países que no conformaban por parte del de grupo de países desarrollados. Ahí en la lámina les he puesto un par de expresiones que me llamaron particularmente la atención. Una con relación a, a nuestra zona sudamericana, en donde la Corte Interamericana de Derechos Humanos básicamente lo, lo que estatuye es que este, la propiedad intelectual bajo ninguna circunstancia puede considerar un impedimento para los derechos humanos, de una manera muy amplia, que recomiendan a los países finalmente que a través de legislación traten de controlar los derechos y los efectos que puedan tenerse en, este, en la regulación de las, de, las, eh, de las vacunas y los registros de propiedad intelectual que se puedan dar sobre ellos. Esto es bien importante, es una resolución de la Comisión o de la Corte, que si bien es cierto, no, no es vinculante de alguna manera, si genera, digamos, una circunstancia por la cual determinado tipo de eh, colectivos de la sociedad civil puedan después generar demandas de indemnización de derechos y permisos contra sus propios estados en caso, digamos, algo sobre la propiedad intelectual pueda ser acusado de ser el culpable de las muertes en pandemia. Y el otro es de Tendaya Chume, que es la relatora especial de Naciones Unidas sobre discriminación, que es mucho más radical todavía. ¿no? Lo que ella mencionaba eh, a mediados del año pasado es que había una suerte de apartheid vacunatorio. O sea, vale decir, el asunto estaba entre los que tenían acceso a las vacunas y los que no teníamos acceso a las vacunas. Entonces, claro, la este, conclusión era, hay abuso. Si hay abuso, vamos a ver nosotros por lo menos en el área sudamericana, ¿qué tan cierto puede ser eso? ¿Qué tanto abuso realmente hay de la propiedad, de los derechos que te da la propiedad intelectual para generar, digamos, como dicen las múltiples notas periodísticas de distintas sociedades internacionales, generar ganancias únicamente para los laboratorios farmacéuticos a costa del de el tema? Bueno, dos datos de la realidad, estamos sin Dos datos de la realidad sudamericana podrían llevar a que la conclusión efectivamente es esa, ¿no? que ha habido un tema de propiedad intelectual contrario a los derechos ciudadanos a acceder a una vacuna al tiempo oportuno. ¿no? Uno, la lentitud evidente de los acuerdos entre las farmacéuticas y los países de Sudamérica. Entonces, bueno, se han demorado tanto en negociar que eso es lo que ha generado que las vacunas terminen llegando con retraso a nuestra población. Y dos, la poca transparencia y oscuridad en las negociaciones. De hecho, en muchos de nuestros países se dieron normas, expresas, leyes, decretos, diciendo que las negociaciones son secretas. Nada de esto se tiene que dar, nada de esto se tiene que ver. Los derechos de acceso a la información pública que puede tener la ciudadanía quedan suspendidos durante el enfoque de pandemia con relación a las negociaciones con las distintas laboratorios farmacéuticos para obtener los Bueno. Con estos datos de la realidad, nosotros planteamos una hipótesis de trabajo. Bueno, que la patente sobre las vacunas otorga una posición de dominio que habría hecho posible que se presenten prácticas abusivas, prácticas de abuso de posición de dominio, que generaron uno, que las vacunas no lleguen a tiempo a la población, que se impongan precios excesivos a los países menos desarrollados y que se impongan condiciones abusivas en la relación comercial. Sobre estas tres hipótesis, hicimos un barrido de, de las cifras y utilizamos las cifras oficiales de la OMS, por ser las cifras más este, controversiales y de, y de barra, ¿no? por, ser, por ser, digamos, de barra. ¿Y es lo que encontramos en el caso de Sudamérica? Encontramos que no es que no hayan llegado a tiempo. Fíjense, en Estados Unidos... La fecha de inicio de vacunación fue en diciembre 14 del 2020. Venezuela, en febrero ya estaba vacunando. Uruguay también. Perú, el 9 de febrero. Paraguay también. Ecuador, desde enero ya estaba vacunando. ¿No? Chile, en diciembre. O sea, al igual, casi que en paralelo que Estados Unidos ya estaba vacunando. Brasil, comenzando enero. 
Bolivia, comenzando febrero, y Argentina, al igual que Brasil, a la par, casi a la par de Estados Unidos. Y en el caso de Colombia, bueno, sí, lamentablemente ustedes tuvieron un, un retroso bastante significativo. O sea, aquí la verdad es que ustedes sí podrían haber dicho que ha habido algo raro, porque hasta bien entrado marzo no comenzaron el proceso de vacunación. Pero, como vamos a ver después, eso tiene otra explicación que no tiene nada que ver con las patentes, no tiene nada que ver con la propiedad intelectual y mucho menos con una práctica abusiva desde el punto de vista competitivo por parte de los laboratorios farmacéuticos, sino que les adelanto del de propio esquema de este ordenamiento legal que tenemos en nuestros países y pidió, en principio, que la negociación fuera más ágil, más rápida y además del lío político que tuvieron también en esa época, porque ellos pasaron por un momento político un poquito complicado. Bueno, otro cuadro para ver si no llegaron a tiempo las vacunas. Mentira, mentira. Al 10 de diciembre del 2022, o sea, un año después de haber comenzado la aplicación de vacunas, a nivel mundial. Miren la situación de Sudamérica. Quienes estaban vacunados con al menos una dosis por cada 100 habitantes. Miren dónde está Estados Unidos, que es el mayor fabricante de vacunas. Comparado a Chile, Argentina, Perú, Brasil, Ecuador, Uruguay, el propio Colombia, que empezó tarde, pero logró ponerse al día rápidamente. Y bueno, Bolivia y Paraguay se están un poquito rezagados. Entonces, no llegaron a tiempo la si estamos comparándolo con el principal país productor de vacunas, que ha sido Estados Unidos, y la distribución de vacunas comenzó casi que en paralelo, la aplicación de por lo menos una dosis por cada 100 habitantes a lo largo del primer año, no hay evidencias de que en Sudamérica llegaron, y llegaron bastante bien. No me creen, peor todavía, el esquema completo de vacunación, ya no una dosis, el esquema completo de vacunación, al 10 de diciembre del 2022, que fue la fecha de cierre de esta data estadística con data de la propia Organización Mundial de Salud, también teníamos lo mismo, o sea, Chile, Perú, Argentina, Uruguay, Ecuador, Brasil, Colombia, están por encima de Estados Unidos, en términos de avances de vacunación y defensa de su propia población, ¿no? Y, y bueno, si Bolivia, Venezuela y Paraguay estaban un tanto rezagados, pero también, nuevamente, por problemas internos, por problemas de distribución, fundamentalmente, para que las vacunas puedan llegar a lo largo de todo su territorio y ser aplicadas a toda su población. Segunda acusación, los precios son excesivos. Las patentes y la, la posición de dominio que le genera la patente al laboratorio le dieron una posición tal que le pudo haber exigido precios abusivos a Sudamérica, porque ese es el contexto dentro del cual se desarrolló la investigación. La respuesta es no. Miren los precios. Por ejemplo, la AstraZeneca, donde casi todos los, todas, todas las regiones este, estudiadas tuvieron, tuvieron participación. En Argentina costaron de 4 a 4,1 dólares. En Brasil, 3,16. En Colombia, un poco más cara, afortunadamente ustedes se demoraron demasiado. Pero, pues, pero en la Unión Europea, de 2,19 a 3,50. O sea, incluso más caro que en Brasil. Lo mismo que en Estados Unidos, a la par que Argentina y por encima de Brasil. Entonces... No estamos hablando de que en la Unión Europea y en Estados Unidos hayan tenido mejores precios como regla general que los precios a los que finalmente se ha terminado comprando o vendiendo la vacuna a los países en Sudamérica. ¿No? Fíjense el caso de Pfizer, que también es otra de las vacunas más populares y las más demandadas en el mundo. ¿No? Si ven los precios, incluso... El precio tanto en la Unión Europea como en Estados Unidos ha sido muy superior al precio al cual se ha vendido en Colombia, Brasil, Argentina y en general en toda la región sudamericana. Este es un cuadro, de alguna manera resumen, que, que marca además las economías más, más grandes que tenemos en, en Sudamérica. Entonces, ¿de qué práctica abusiva estamos hablando? Sino que más bien la evidencia de los números, ¿no? y estos son números... Este, también de la, de la Organización Mundial de la Salud ¿no? que nos da a entender que no este, este, esta declaraciones altisonantes de estas autoridades mundiales eh, sobre todo de salud no tienen sustento, por lo menos en el caso de Sudamérica con los números además hay una tercera una tercera, este, pre una tercera hipótesis de trabajo y es que se impusieron condiciones abusivas a los países que no eran los países desarrollados. Y bueno, 
¿Por qué condiciones abusivas? Es que hubo secretismo. Bueno, también lo hubo en Europa. También lo hubo en Europa. O sea, de hecho, los colectivos y las protestas sociales en Europa terribles fueron precisamente por el secretismo. Y hubo normas europeas también que dijeron que no, estas negociaciones son secretas, son cerradas. No vamos a decir qué es lo que se va a tener. Claro, en el caso de Europa negociaron el paquete, teóricamente con mejores condiciones. Pero también el secretismo fue una regla durante la época. ¿Por qué fue regla? Por lo que te digo ahí al final. Porque había necesidad de que existan cláusulas de confidencialidad. Porque eran contextos de gran demanda y oferta restringida. Y un bien socialmente sensible, altamente sensible. Cualquier cosa que se diga, para bien o para mal, podría incendiar la pared. Aquí no estamos hablando de un contexto de un abuso por parte de las farmacéuticas, sino estamos hablando de una práctica comercial común. O sea, cuando tenemos alta demanda, baja oferta, y el tema es sensible socialmente, lo peor que puedes hacer es transparentar, porque si transparentas, lo que vas a encontrar es que con todo proceso de negociación van a haber propuestas de uno y otro tipo, y la gente lo que va a hacer es, con la corriente de opinión pública, lo que va a hacer es entorpecer esas negociaciones y probablemente generar que no se llegue a buen puerto en algo que además todos estamos de acuerdo que era necesario que se pueda cerrar lo más rápido posible. La población necesitaba más. Y el elemento principal por el que se habla de que eran condiciones abusivas son las cláusulas de exención de responsabilidad. ¿No? Las farmacéuticas nos hicieron firmar a todos los países en el mundo. Y si algo pasaba, ellos no eran los responsables. Ellos no eran los culpables, sino los gobiernos, que eran los que habían comprado y financiado, en muchos casos, muchos casos las, las operaciones. ¿Y el Instituto de el análisis económico del derecho absolutamente racional. ¿Quién está en mejor posición de asumir los riesgos en este tipo de transacción? ¿Los gobiernos o las empresas privadas que están tratando de desarrollar algo a mil kilómetros por hora? por la necesidad de la sociedad de que esto se dé. El sacar una vacuna rápidamente tenía un alto riesgo. Eso es claro que lo tenía. ¿Quién tiene que asumir ese riesgo? El que está trabajando y desarrollando la vacuna, la empresa, o los gobiernos que tienen la capacidad, la facilidad, y son los que además están promoviendo no solamente la producción, la fabricación, sino también la distribución luego de las vacunas. Entonces, no eran precios abusivos, no eran cláusulas abusivas, las vacunas no es que se llegaron, llegaron primero a la Unión Europea, llegaron primero a, la, a, a, a los Estados Unidos y luego llegaron recién, por lo menos a Sudamérica, no hemos hecho el análisis de Asia, no hemos hecho el análisis de África, en el caso de Sudamérica, pues por ahí no lo vemos. ¿Cuál es la conclusión? La conclusión es que no existe evidencia, o sea, esto ya no es a mí me parece, yo creo, o sea, no existe evidencia las cifras y las datas oficiales de la propia Organización Mundial de Salud para sostener en el caso sudamericano durante la pandemia del COVID-19 los laboratorios hayan desarrollado prácticas de abuso de posición de dominio basadas en sus derechos de propiedad que tiene la mano. Esto ha habido entonces, que es lo que hemos podido advertir y eso está como para una post-investigación, que ha habido es una ineficiencia muy grande, muy grande en nuestros aparatos gubernativos en general en todo Sudamérica, que no solamente no hemos estado preparados con el nivel legislativo, sino que tampoco hemos tenido la capacidad de poder manejar esta crisis adecuadamente. Nuestra red de distribución en casos de emergencia sanitaria ha sido deficiente. No es solamente el tema de las vacunas. O sea, en mi país se murieron miles de personas porque no había oxígeno que nos dimos cuenta de que teníamos una sola planta productora de oxígeno y que cuando a raíz de la pandemia un montón quisieron entrar porque es relativamente sencillo producirlo, inmediatamente el aparato estatal lo que hizo fue llegar a clausurarlos, a cerrarlos, a multarlos y una vez que se dieron cuenta que no podían estar los cerrados como lo necesitaban, inmediatamente llegaron los aparatos de, de protección al consumidor a decirle que estaban cobrando muy caro por el oxígeno. Entonces, el propio Estado, el propio aparato gubernativo, se puso en contra de que podamos asumir de manera rápida y responsable frente a la población eh, el de enfrentar, digamos, la, la crisis del COVID-19 de manera exitosa. Cientos de miles de personas murieron en la región 
y la percepción a partir de la investigación, no es como la investigación, pero es mi percepción, que eh, por lo menos más de la mitad de esas muertes se pudieran haber prevenido simplemente mejorando gestión pública. Conclusión en que no es la propiedad intelectual, no es el derecho a la competencia, sino es la pura y dura gestión pública la que tendríamos que mejorar a futuro. Así que, gracias por su atención. Ok, so, uh, thank you, Professor Dante. Indeed, I, well, I want to highlight about your presentation is precisely that what the pandemic and and of course any crisis where it's going to to show up is the lack of uh, public uh, procurement access right the lack of public um, uh, or better the, the lack of uh, public infrastructure to actually attend these kinds of crises no So indeed, I, I also remember that during the pandemic, and it was not only a problem of Peru or Colombia or South America, I think in general in the world, the problem was basically that everybody wants to point out someone uh, to be guilty for the situation and everybody said, oh yes, it's the patents. So let's go for the waiver, the problem is the patents or the problem is the competition. I found quite interesting in your research uh, with the data that you are showing that it was more like a myth. Right? It was more like a myth because uh, it was not an abusive price, it was not uh, abusive conditions, and even as Lisa was saying before uh, leaving us, it was not um, the fact that, oh yes, we have these contracts that are abusive, and so on, because we're talking about certain states from the global south that are not able to produce the patents or, or the vaccines. It was deeper than that, it's a whole system that has been built in a particular way that one of a sudden, in the middle of the pandemic, it wasn't working, right? So, uh, coming from there, let's talk a little bit about what has been presented to me. Um, first of all, I want to talk about the topic of transparency. And of course, one thing is transparency from the perspective of uh, uh, intellectual property, and transparency also from the, the point of view of competition. How do you see the problem of transparency on this issue? Because, uh, for instance, for competition, Professor Dante, do you think transparency was a real issue in the whole system or transparency uh, or the problem of transparency in the contrast? It's just something that it wasn't relevant for the purpose of attending the pandemic. But transparency is necessary. Uh, and this is civil right, the basic civil right. Uh, I, I, I agree with you, Paris. But I, I agree too that uh, there are situations in the team must put a stop, so to say, not here, because it's not good for the um, in common good. situation in the world no abrir una negociación gubernamental. O sea, todo lo gubernamental, la regla es, todo lo gubernamental tiene que ser transparente. Uh -huh. Pero hay elementos en donde la transparencia no es buena. Y este es uno de ellos. Si nos poníamos a hacer un disclosure de cómo iban las negociaciones con cada uno de los laboratorios, en los gobiernos, lo que íbamos a tener es distintos grupos de la sociedad civil enfrentándose, y hemos visto en Latinoamérica en los últimos 10 años, los enfrentamientos sangrientos que hay por otros actos. Y, y, y más aún, en el caso de las vacunas, en el caso de que está el derecho a la vida, además, en el juego, hubiera sido mucho peor. O sea, y eso nos debe hacer reflexionar ¿no? acerca de si, si existen de verdad derechos absolutos o derechos que debemos ponerlos por encima de todo. ¿no? Y más bien comenzar a pensar que el derecho debe servir al ser humano y, y que hay situaciones en las cuales estos dogmas de fe con los que vamos construyendo nuestra ciudadanía, tendremos que también admitir que hay excepciones y que hay situaciones de excepcionalidad en donde la bienes, bienes públicos, que creo que es un bien público, la transparencia, la gestión pública, no necesariamente son la, son la mejor llave para solucionar el problema que tiene la sociedad. Okay, so just, just to sum up, <laughs> the, the fact that there are absolute rights or not, it's something that we have to question, especially in the, in the moment there exists an emergency, such as a pandemic, and it has been shown. 
Uh, so, uh, for that purpose, Professor Ray, from the perspective of, uh, of intellectual property, what should, should be the position in your opinion? A ver, eh, recuerden algo, ¿no? Cuando nosotros empezamos a analizar o realizar la investigación, las patentes farmacéuticas no se habían depositado, en, digamos, en esta parte del mundo, ¿no? en Latinoamérica en general. Y esto es porque el sistema de protección de patentes global tiene un procedimiento a seguir. Las solicitudes de patentes internacionales para todo lo que son vacunas farmacéuticas contra el covid no habían entrado en a lo que se denomina fase nacional. O sea, no había conocimiento, además, dentro del procedimiento. Eh, la, una vez que presenta una solicitud de patente, esta no se hace pública hasta cuando se publica. Luego que es analizar el proceso, además, que es de reserva de la información, que debe mantenerse, obviamente, de manera más clara. Así que creo que son dos cosas diferentes. Uno, las farmacéuticas negociaban directamente con los estados, no quisieron negociar con intermediarios, era farmacéutica con Estado, laboratorio farmacéutica con Estado, y además tenía que dar muy fino, porque hasta ese entonces no sabía si iban a ser públicas sus patentes a través del, perdón, a vacunas a través del sistema de patentes, porque finalmente el sistema de patentes sirve para hacer público una solución técnica a un problema técnico. La solución técnica era que habían encontrado la vacuna para el COVID-19. Pues todavía no habían diseñado cuál iba a ser la estrategia, o si la protección a través del derecho de patentes, o tal vez iba a ser un secreto industrial. ¿no? Entonces, creo que eso acompañó también la negociación, y como refiere mi colega Dante, la necesidad de mantener en reserva toda esta información. Es un estado de incertidumbre. Es un estado de incertidumbre. Sí, definitivamente con la pandemia. Y al final, todo nos quedamos who are lawyers, when we are making a contract, at the end what we are trying to reduce is the amount of, of uncertainty. Imagine in the, in, the, in the world of the pandemic, where you don't know what was going on. As you said, in Peru, how many people died and everything that happened in Colombia and everything that happened around the world. So indeed the whole system is built for reduce that uncertainty. Uh, but what is the problem with how we try to reduce uncertainty also might enter into, into a clash with uh, what we were talking about of, of what Professor Lante mentioned, that the system has to provide solution for human beings, just for the sake of it. So before continuing with that, I think Professor Barton also has a comment on the matter. Yes. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I just want to um, also uh, highlight uh, what uh, uh, Dante and Rai said earlier, because I think that for those that uh, our audience, I think uh, I have been in, in, in touch now with uh, some of our audiences, happy to be connected with someone from Turkey who has written about this on competition and IP and, uh, and also health related issues. And I think that the research that we try to, to put forward right at the beginning of the pandemic was precisely to this what uh, normally it was the fact at that time. As we have said repeatedly, uh, they were trying to find reasons as to why allegedly uh, the developing countries citizens could not have access to the COVID-19 vaccines. But as has been demonstrated by the research in the area where Professor Mendoza said that access to vaccines has been there right from the outset, even in the case of uh, Southern uh, American countries or South American countries. Um, if we look at other countries in the world, uh, Asia Pacific or Africa, uh, you can see that the type of vaccines that they access were different from those that, uh, that South American countries had. So, um, and the result of the research proved with evidence because we also undertook interviews to competition authorities from four jurisdictions, as well as IP authorities from four jurisdictions. As a matter of fact, we did interview competition authority representatives from Colombia and from IP authorities in Colombia. We also did the same in Peru, and we also did the same in India and as well as South Africa. 
everything has been documented. This research will probably go on and on because we have a lot of materials that we have not unfolded yet. But what we want to do at this provocative research is to say, wait a second, competition and IP concerns are not really a concern in the access to vaccines or were not really a concern to the Peruvian, Colombian, South American scenario because of one, two, three, we look at, we look at competition concerns from the abuse of dominant positions uh, scenarios from the uh, ex excessive pricing or even consumer protection considerations, and we have found no evidence so far. However, something that has not been researched when it comes to competition law, it's about cross-border cartels. We are talking about pharmaceutical companies colluding between themselves. This is one of the areas that is close to my heart because I actually um, been working on that and I published a book on cross-border cartels back in 2020, where we discussed about developing countries' uh, concerns on cross-border cartels. And I looked at the pharma sector and it has been documented so far that international cartels like the vitamin cartels have actually uh, put together developing countries, uh, uh, even public procurement concerns, Brazilians, uh, in South America have been heavily embedded by the rise of prices in the vitamins during the cartels. But that's something that we have not researched because this was not necessarily the bulk of the research here. Now, the second part of what, what I want to say is that uh, as uh, Professor uh, Rai said earlier, um, the, the, the crisis, um, people started to finger points to see who is going to do this, who has done this to blame different different actors, different, and, and you have heard already from, from the example I just talked about from uh, the CEO of Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance that were responsible for COVAX. They said really, really important. It says that COVAX facility was indeed a global initiative that meant to ensure equitable access of COVID-19 vaccine uh, and not necessarily focusing energy on to release the diplomatic discussions of the TRIPS Council in Geneva. And that's something that we have to take into account. And as a matter of fact, I haven't said that earlier, but I work at the United Nations. I'm a UN staff member. I've been working 19 years in Geneva. Uh, nowadays, I'm working in Asia Pacific. And the result of the, the work I've done with competition authorities around the world is that they jurisdictional basis. We talked about earlier in other panels about the extraterritorial application of competition laws, particularly for the US antitrust laws, but that's something that doesn't apply to developing countries laws. And, and that is something that we have to take into account also when it comes to the analysis in there. So I'm happy to, to uh, comment on, on all, all questions because I think uh, our colleague from Turkey would like to add something on this. Yes. He has written a book on that. He's just telling me on the chat. Thank you. Yes, we have we have some more questions, but before that, I, and this is something that we can uh, elaborate a little bit later on. For instance, which is the position uh, as Andean countries that we have? Peru, Ecuador, Bolivia, and Colombia, we, we belong to CAN. So, which is the solution that we can create uh, from CAN for that matter? And now that Professor Horda was mentioning the cross border cartels, I'm not sure how prepared uh, the Andean community for that kinds of situations, right? So uh, before we elaborate on that, uh, which are the questions that we have in the chat? No, I can't answer that one. I don't know. Someone research here? Yeah, should, so, should I? Can you uh, hear yes. me? Yes, we can hear you, Abdullah, please. All right. Hi, everyone from Turkey. I am Abdullah from uh, Istanbul University, and uh, I'm delighted to just, uh, I cannot jo join in the person, but uh, it is, of course, a pleasure to, you know, watch watch it online. And it's mid uh, midnight here, one in the morning, so. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much, all the speakers. Uh, my question is not directly related to the to the uh, IP rights of the vaccines and the competition, but as the uh, Dr. Uh, Horner just uh, mentioned the excessive pricing. I know that the in the in the text which has been uh, you know adopted by the uh, WTO uh, Council, 
uh, which was about the TRIPS waiver, there was something like the, 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 there should be some, you know, some, uh, you know, something about the pricing, the, saying that there should be not, you know, excessive pricing and the prices should be, you know, in a uh, meaningful uh, manner. Uh, in this term, uh, um, and maybe the speakers just, you know, uh, could have mentioned them in uh, during their speak, uh, you know, speech. But uh, sorry, I have just uh, joined uh, the the this session a little bit late. So, um, what do you think of the achievements of the trips waiver, uh, you know, text and the uh, and the you know, there is a very lately uh, text under the all pieces of uh, world. Health health organization, the pandemic treaty, so-called pandemic treaty. What do you think uh, these texts are, has achieved? And do you think these, uh, these texts could say something about the competition or in, you know, in terms of uh, access to uh, COVID or other uh, vaccines? Thank you very much. Okay, so Professor Pierre, if you could please answer the question. Sure. No, thank you, uh, Abdullah. And um, uh, you are not alone here. I'm also in the middle of my night. I'm in Spain now. So it's uh, 10 in the morning here. So you must be 1.30 uh, or even more in Turkey. So you are not alone uh, waking up early uh, or late, to, to, to speak. Now, on your question, uh, I would like to say two things on this. First, um, from the perspective of the, um, the access to sorry, to the pandemic treaty on the WHO. I think this is a, a remarkable uh, success as you, as you saw. Um, now, the, the, the way has been put forward uh, in connection to our topics on competition and IP issues is that it, it actually, um, um, out, to my point of view at least, it endorses what uh, um, uh, COVAX has been putting forward so far uh, in putting a more transparency uh, views in terms of the vaccine supply. Uh, and also it has helped uh, in many ways to stop the export bans um, um, that, that I think was uh, needed so much when it comes to the first uh, year of the COVAX uh, uh, facility that was uh, put forward during the middle of the pandemic. So the, the, the treating itself uh, makes actually easier uh, the question that the moderator has said earlier on transparency. I think transparency would definitely be an important way of negotiating contracts with the pharmaceutical companies uh, in a way that uh, um, could be more um, accessible to the mid middle income countries. But the reality is that in some countries, I'm not talking about South America now, because um, I'm more familiar now with Asia Pacific, since this is my work currently in Thailand. Um, I must say that transparency, uh, uh, when it comes to these countries, it's also it's only applicable to certain types of vaccines and not to uh, to any type of vaccine. For instance, uh, we are talking about Western type of vaccines. You will have more transparency than Chinese or Russian uh, uh, manufactured led vaccines. Uh, and, and that's something that it depends on how censorship is actually included in the way uh, it's being supplied to these countries. As you remember, probably, um, I'm not sure you're aware, but at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, either Chinese or Russian vaccines uh, were circulated to the Asia Pacific countries. And, uh, and that was imposed by European countries to actually have the European uh, or Western vaccines rather than uh, Asia Pacific, uh, sorry, uh, Russian or Chinese vaccines. That will lead to actually lots of distortions in travel uh, during the beginning, uh, beginning of 2021 and the rest of the year. So that's the first part of the question. The second part of the question, if I'm understanding correctly, uh, um, Abdullah, is about the, the way in which you, um, you, you, you look at uh, the analysis of our own work uh, in terms of competition and IP. Um, the interaction here uh, for now at least is not frictional because uh, it has not been, uh, uh, and that's what Professor Mendoza was said earlier, uh, we have not yet looked at 
uh, we have not found elements for excessive pricing, uh, not even at the international level, uh, less so at the domestic level. The elements of excessive prices are not there met for the perspective of the, um, the, 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 the pharmaceutical company. Um, and also the uh, elements for the dominance in the market because of fierce competition of uh, vaccines uh, uh, in different countries, particularly in the jurisdictions we, under, we access in our research has also been an important uh, workable, contestable market uh, uh, competition. So um, now a topic that has not been researched and I have to give that caveat to you is international predatory pricing. Cross-border cross -border predatory pricing, it's something that we have not looked at uh, because it requires also an assessment of trade related measures as well. And, and that's something that we, it goes beyond the scope of our paper. But of course, I mean, we can certainly discuss this in the next paper that we're gonna work on will be on vaccine supply, and which by the way, will be published fully in English. And, and, and I'm sure we will be in contact with you to, to, to have your, your comments as well. Thank you. Surely, I, I would be a pleasure. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, Abdullah. Thank you, Professor. I don't know if, he, if there is any other question from our audience in person. No? Okay, so for the purpose of the closure, I just want to make a question for each of our, our panelists. Uh, which is okay. At the end, we have realized that we have contracts, we have the IP system, we have the competition law. But do you think that this system of, of rules is actually providing a social benefit for these kinds of extreme situations? Or is it that we just don't know how to use the systems that we have created? Okay, yes. <laughs> a ver, creo que lo que hemos concluido de la investigación es que no, esto, esto no es un problema de propiedad intelectual ni de prácticas anticompetitivas. Es un tema de gestión de los propios estados. No estamos preparados, además está orientado algunos, digamos, las cosas groseras en el manejo de la salud de nuestros países. No, no somos buenos negociando, eh, no priorizamos este tipo de cosas. Pero no tiene que ver con el tema de patentes ni con temas de derecho de la competencia. Eso es lo que hemos identificado. Sí creemos firmemente, por lo menos, que las patentes farmacéuticas o el sistema de patentes genera un bienestar social. Es un equilibrio entre el acceso a los medicamentos, el avance para la, la, encontrar la cura o el diagnóstico para tratar algunas enfermedades. Porque si en realidad no hiciéramos público o los laboratorios farmacéuticos no utilizarían el sistema de patentes, no encontraríamos al final ese avance para la cura de algunas enfermedades. O sea, yo creo que el sistema beneficia, así como está diseñado, trata de ser un sistema equilibrado donde le da obviamente exclusividad al inicio, pero luego beneficia a la sociedad porque toda esa investigación, todas esas curas, todas esas vacunas, todos esos medicamentos terminan cayendo en algo que se llama dominio público que son libremente explotadas por cualquier laboratorio sin pago de regalías, sin pago de derechos de patente. Creo que al final sí hay un beneficio. En situaciones extremas, ya creo que los APICs establecen algunas posibilidades para superar estas situaciones extremas. Las licencias obligatorias son un sistema. Esto habría que digamos, evaluar si es que en algunos de otros supuestos la excepción de los derechos o el waiver beneficia también, pero en este caso de la pandemia en particular, eso no ha sido el principal. En mi caso, yo soy más pesimista, pero ya ¿no? <risa> concuerdo con Ray, que no es un tema de propiedad intelectual, no es que la patente haya generado acuerdos, no es que las, las actuaciones abusivas de abuso de posición de dominio hayan generado acuerdos, ha generado acuerdos, son muy mala normativa muy mala gestión, muy mal control. Y la pregunta que nos deberíamos hacer ahora, a mediados del 2023, es ¿y qué hemos avanzado en nuestros tres temas? O sea, ¿Qué hemos hecho en nuestros países con esa revolución? 
se abrieron un montón de excepciones, que por lo menos en mi país se volvieron a cerrar. Estamos con la misma normativa de antes de pandemia, igualito, o sea, no hemos cambiado nada, ni siquiera hemos hecho el ajuste de que ante situaciones excepcionales se podrá hacer lo que aprendimos, ¿no? Hemos regresado a la misma, a la misma regulación. La gestión nos está entrenando para poder gestionar hospitales y crisis sanitarias adecuadamente. Para nada. De hecho, el gran problema ahorita es cómo deshacerse de la gente que se contrató para poder atender en pandemia. O sea, el tema es, es de todos. ¿Es eso está pasando en Perú ahora mismo? Y en el tema de control, han habido directores de hospital que conscientemente no compraron, no compraron oxígeno, no compraron mascarillas, no compraron lo que se necesitaba para el manejo de pandemia y generaron la muerte de cientos de doctores. Los doctores en mi país han muerto, pero de una manera espectacular. Porque no tenían medios de protección. ¿Y por qué no los tenían? Porque hay mucho miedo al sistema de control. Como los precios comenzaron a subir, yo no voy a comprar ahí porque después viene Contraloría y la Contraloría va a decirle que yo compré eso de carrado, que quito. Tenemos que reflexionar por el miedo a los corruptos. La corrupción es un cáncer endémico en nuestros países. Voy a decir que no. Pero la solución para luchar contra la corrupción no puede ser un sistema ciego, sordo y chartamudo que esté encima de los funcionarios públicos, honestos, impidiendo que hagan buena gestión, impidiendo que creen valor público, impidiendo que generen soluciones a los problemas que se presta la sociedad. ¿Qué estamos haciendo para repensar la manera de controlar? Pues claro que hay que controlar, por supuesto que hay que controlar, pero hay que controlar de otra manera. Porque lo que se está haciendo ahora es ahogar a la gestión pública en un sistema que lo único que hace es perjudicar día a día a la sociedad y en situaciones de crisis, como la crisis de la pandemia, no te explota y cuesta vidas, cuesta miles de vidas humanas, como ha sido en este caso. Eh, profesor Horta, ¿do you want to say something about the question? Sure, sure. I um, I think that um, well, first of all, I would like to um, say a couple of words uh, about would you ask a question about the Andean community in, in whether or not we are or not uh, actually uh, capable of addressing cross-border anti-competitive practices? And um, I have been working a lot with the Andean community uh, secretariat uh, back in the day uh, when they received uh, um, a lot of support from the EU to pass the decision 608 back in 2005, um, the application of the uh, Andean community law back in the day where Colombia, of course, uh, uh, Peru, uh, Bolivia and Ecuador, they are the founding members. Venezuela used to be a member, as you know, but in 2006, they, they left uh, the community. Uh, but then um, my, my a short answer will be that they are not really uh, capable to, um, under, to address um, cross-border cartels at the regional level, or at least in these four jurisdictions, because of different uh, uh, reasons related to the law, to the substantive uh, uh, application of the law, as well as the procedural aspects of the law, and finally, of the resources that needed to undertake such investigations. So I'm familiar with that uh, in the day, um, used to work a lot with these countries, uh, with the competition authorities of the four jurisdictions that I just mentioned. Uh, nowadays, um, I might be surprised if the situation has changed. Um, I don't think so. But if this is changed, that would be a positive development. But back in the day, in between 2005 and 2012, when I was working actively with these countries, um, I saw that uh, there was a great potential. There was one case actually initiated by a Colombian company on cartels uh, that was actually addressed by the Andean Community Secretariat, but then it went to the Quito Tribunal and that stopped there. It never actually finalized it. And I would be surprised if this has been finalized. So having said that footnote, let me just go back to the final remarks of this research. Um, one thing that uh, when I uh, talk to my colleagues here with Dante, with Rai, with uh, Enrique, with, uh, with Mar Jose Antonio in Peru, um, 
the, the idea of bringing this research from day one is because we wanted to corroborate what happened, really happened during these first months of the pandemic. What really happened? And the question and the answer is very clear. Uh, competition or IP concerns were not there. Were not there even during the worst times of the pandemic. Even when Joseph Stiglitz wanted to have a campaign against Biden administration or Trump first and then Biden administration to make sure that pharma companies do not lobby uh, against the, 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 the trip waiver. This was the peak of the discussion at the, at the, at the global level. And in Peru, as well as many developing countries, what was more important is who is first in the line. International public procurement, that was the issue and how to handle this effectively as Dante just said, uh, as a conclusion of our paper. Now, international public procurement, that also leads to a problem that is a little bit hidden in competition law, which is bid rigging. Now, international bid rigging, Colombian law, for instance, uh, is one of the color competition laws that actually penalizes, criminalizes bid rigging in a very severe way. As far as your law and as far as I'm concerned, uh, when I was working for the Colombian Competition Authority. And this is a major issue because it's taxpayers' money. And the way it has been handled is that, for instance, if we go very far away from Latin America, Indonesia, the, the public procurement has been actually uh, uh, addressed from the corruption point of view, which has already been said by Dante as well. The corruption uh, 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 has led to public, uh, to, to bid rigging uh, uh, unlawful activities that competition enforcers, competition watchdogs have actually ruled out. The question is, this is an international bid rigging. How on earth you're gonna enforce this if there's not an antitrust authority that can lead at the international level, let alone the US uh, authorities that only work on the basis of whether or not they impact their, their, their authorities or their uh, uh, US soil. So the point here I want to make is that what left us as developing countries, what is left as a result of all this at the end of the day, is what you can manage realistically with the limited resources to avoid what happened during the first months of the pandemic. It is true that during the first months, and it's still in Peru and many other competitions, many other jurisdictions, there's political turmoil. You change president, you change administration. Everyone what wants to blame the former administration. That's what happened in Peru as well. During the, the pandemic, we had a president, then we have another president, and that also led to different problems. So as a lesson learned from, from what we have here is that we have a limited amount of public policy tools that we have to capitalize it in the best way, taking into account what we have achieved as a developing country, as a, in the case of Peru, as a public policy consideration to make sure that coordination between uh, competition, IP, and other authorities, in this case of Peru, the uh, IP authority and the uh, public procurement authority cannot be centralized. Let's imagine, for instance, for one second, if Peru, Colombia, Ecuador, Argentina, they go together as a regional public bidding, and they have much more bargaining power to negotiate contracts with the big pharma companies. That's something that never happened. Will it be happening in the future? That's one of the reasons why we are doing a second paper. And with that, I finish because I think time is, is limited. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Portman. Yes. So just to uh, a closure, thank you to Professor Portman. Thank you for the attendees virtually and the attendees inside. And I just want to say that for me, the problem indeed is more a problem of public policy and how to use the tools that we have. And I have to say that I'm a pessimist as you, Professor Dante. However, <laughs> hope that we are doing Thank you very much to everyone. Have a good day. <laughs>